My name is Duncan Blair. Uh, I'm my lovely assistant here is my wife Susan. Uh, I want to give thanks. I want to thank Katie and Pam, the video folks, the man who's not here, uh, John Alber, who solved the mysteries of the machinery. Uh, we all know that these things don't just happen. They take effort and thought and planning and uh, a certain amount of physical labor. So I want to introduce myself from what my point of view is. I am not an academic. I say again, not an academic. Uh, I have a couple of graduate degrees. I have 40 years in natural resource management, specifically grass. Um, I am an enthusiastic amateur when it comes to uh, traditional sale. I have a blog called Traditional Sale Blue Wing, which I've had for about a year. And in an act of shameless self-promotion, I will tell you that I have my business cards for blue, that uh, traditional sale blue wing dot substack dot com. Uh, you're welcome. It's free. Um, I describe myself <clears throat> as a shade tree anthropologist, meaning an amateur. Uh, I, I do have a uh, graduate degree in, in cultural anthropology, but from the last century. Um, and my approach to this, to the topic of traditional sale, is less about the boats, their names, their specs, their captains, their builders, and then it is about the boats, the people who sailed them, what they carried, why they carried that, where they went, and why the variety of rigs were, were used. I, <clears throat> I just published a, a, a blog. And I, I, I call your attention to this, because I'm blogging about one of the a four-masted schooner. This was this is a series of drawings. It says, Florida's Marine Maritime Heritage Ske Sketchbook of Philip A. Sawyer, 1938. This is done by the Works Progress Association. None of us here are old enough to remember that, but I know what it is. Okay. Uh, <clears throat> by all about boats that were in Florida. I ran across a boat that, given my point of view, I loved. A four-masted schooner called Chiquimula. Chiquimula is a place name in Latin America. Chiquimula hauled goat manure from Santo Domingo on the southern coast of Hispaniola to Tampa, Florida. Now, I read that and I said, oh, that's, that's got to be, uh, that sounds like a topic for one of my blogs. <laughs> Why goat manure? And I go into that. And yesterday, I got an email from a guy who'd, who'd read it. And he had gotten an email from, a, he's in Idaho. He got an email from a friend in Maine who had read it and told him, and he passed on to me, that this was going on, this was in 1928, that this was going on in the first decade of the, 19, of the 20th century with goat manure from Venezuela. So there's a story there. And it's, uh, that's the kind of thing that interests me. So uh, be prepared for some of that. I try to ask myself, why is this important? Who cares? Recently, I ran across a statement by a guy in England who has a Whidbey cobble, which is a 25 to 30 foot open boat design. It was used in the North Sea 
on the east coast of England for fishing. And here's what he said, and uh, this is when, the, I have a cheap sign maker. The tradition is very easily lost when you don't have to make your living by it. And that really resonated with me. None of us, I, I don't think, I doubt that none, few if any of us are making our living but following the sea. But so that puts it on our shoulders to keep the tradition alive, to not let the tradition be lost, because the tradition is valuable and it is still alive. And we're fortunate to know of it, to talk about it, to share it with others. So this is what I'm focused on. Okay. Schooners, raise your hand if you ever heard of Joshua Slocum. Okay, my wife's sick of hearing about Joshua Slocum. <laughs> Joshua Slocum was the first man to circumnavigate, single-handedly circumnavigate the planet. He did it in the last few years of the 19th century. He had been a longtime sea captain and was, found himself out of a job, put out of a job by, by steam, and he was given by an old fishing captain a wreck of a boat, a oyster dredger, drudger as they say, that was in, famously in a pasture under a cherry tree in, you know, two dot Massachusetts. I don't know, it's all the same to me, Pam. <laughs> um, he rebuilt, he had a bucket full of spikes and adds a saw and an ax, and he rebuilt the spray. He took out her, her centerboard, he put in a keel, and he rebuilt the spray. But she, like the governor Stone, was still the spray. No matter how much new timber was put into her, almost at least 150 years after her original construction, she was still the spray. So that's the same with the Governor Stone. The Governor Stone's been through a lot. I am going to talk about the Governor Stone, but I'm going to talk about some other stuff too. Okay? So here we go. <laughs> Fast, agile, and practical. The schooner is a rig. It can be on any number of hulls. There are variations in the schooner rig. There are topsail schooners, there are bald-headed schooners, and I hope we can all agree that bald is beautiful. <laughs> there are four square, four topsail schooners. I'll show you a picture of one of those. In the fruit trade, in southern England, there are staysail schooners, there are terrapin schooners. So the schooner is a rig. I'm going to show you the rig, explain it from my perspective, and then show you a number of different hulls that it went on doing a number of different jobs in a number of different places under a number of different conditions. Okay, one of those places is Apalachicola, and I'll ex explain the, well, I'll, I'll do it right now. Here, the smaller is a, is a nautical chart of Apalachicola. The numbers are the depths in feet, not meters, not fathom, but the depths in feet of the water at mean low tide. So, worst possible scenario. <laughs> Okay, and you can see they're pretty shallow. Typically, in the cotton era, when ships came here to, to carry the cotton back either to the Northeast or to England, those seagoing ships could not safely enter Apalachicola Bay because it's so shoal. This is to show you exactly how shoal it is. This shows, because it's modern, shows the dredged 
channel for the Intracoastal Waterway and the channel out through the Sykes Cut, the government cut. Obviously, those didn't exist in uh, the 1830s and 40s. So here was all this, copper, all this cotton stacked up on the docks down on Water Street, a lot of, worth a lot of money. And offshore, outside the island, were the ships that were to carry it back. So what was called upon, what was needed, were lighters, like a cigarette light, spelled like cigarette lighters. And these were shoal draft ships or barges sometimes in the steam era that could be towed by a steam tug. But in 1830, they were small schooners that were shoal draft. They had center boards. So when they heard that start to, board start to drag in the, in the bottom, they could lift it up. You know, there's only two kinds of sailors, those who've run aground and those who say they haven't. <laughs> OK? So to avoid that embarrassment and to get the ships offshore loaded and go make some money, you needed lighters. You needed an, a, a middleman, so to speak, in that cargo chain from, from the origin, origin of, the, of the cotton downstream, off on the dock, weighed, bailed, whatever, then out offshore to the cargo ship that would carry it back to its final destination. OK, let's have, let me get my cheater here. Let's have the first lights off, please. Okay, this is the governor's stone. This is the typical schooner rig. Two masts, either both of the same height or the aftermost mast, the back one, the rear one, slightly taller than the front. In this case, they're equal height. Sometimes they have top masts. I think she has top masts, but they're struck. They're not up right now for topsails. Topsails are small, but they're very effective because there's more. The, the, the wind aloft is cleaner than the wind aloo. OK, be cleaner in the sense that it is, it's not it's more constant, consistent, not disturbed by friction with the surface of the water. I should say wind aloft, wind low. So that's why you see topsails. I'm going to show you another example of topsails. OK, next one, please. This is the same schooner rig seen from aloft. This is a pinky schooner from the, a design from the early, 18, early 19th century, built in 2008 in, in uh, Essex, Massachusetts, by a sixth generation, excuse me, a sixth generation boat builder named Harold Burnham, who has uh, been uh, awarded by the National Endowment of Arts. And he runs, he's a boat builder. He's, there are wonderful videos on Harold Burnham. Check it out. The pinky was used for fishing, mostly fishing up by lines off the boat. See this long? The, the, the joke is that this long, it's not even a taffle, this long overhanging stern was used as a head by the sailors, irrespective of that. Small. Burdensome, two sails, two masts, still a schooner. OK, next one, please. This is a book, boat called the Selena Beale, built in 1909. She, last I heard, was in Harold Burnham's yard in Essex being rebuilt. She looks like a knife in the water. And you see she does not have a bowsprit. This is what's called a knockabout. The forestay attaches to the stem, 
And if it's a sloop, it's, it can be on a sloop. It's a knockabout sloop. This is a knockabout schooner. She was probably a working boat. I don't know much, a whole lot about her. You can see she's got low top sides. It would be easy to launch a dory or, or pull fish up out here. 1909. Okay. Oh, let, let's talk about fast. You all, can we have the lights back, please? Do you know about the Bernoulli effect? Yes. Okay. Can we, well, we can do it here. You, you saw it better with the, the pinky. You can see the wind coming off this sail, the, the windward side of this sail is going around the leeward side of that sail, side of that sail, and on. The wind coming off the windward side of this sail is going around here. The, the Bernoulli effect, which is named after a 16th century physicist in, from Switzerland, showed how an airfoil, this is an airfoil, looking at an at a airplane wing. Okay, so these are airfoils in the vertical. So when the wind goes, two particles of wind, one on this side, one on the other side, the one on the curved side has to go faster to catch up with the one on the other side. That means that the boat is literally if it's got a resistance built in with a keel or a centerboard, pulled into the wind at an angle, okay? So you take this, you multiply, it's a multiplier effect of, high, of aerodynamics. You divide it up into small manageable pieces that one or two crewmen can handle. And it's fore and aft. It's not a square sole like this, with guys up here on foot ropes hanging over the yards trying to set the sails. All the work is done from the deck, smaller sails, aerodynamically superior. Smaller sails mean smaller crew, smaller crew means lower overheads. Being able to go to, to weather more efficiently than a square rigger, not as efficiently as a modern Bermuda headed sail, but more so than the square rigs, square sails, which were the correct comparison at the time, means that it can tack, it can get from here to there in say three tacks, where a square rigger would take five. So faster, more agile, and able to get in places that square riggers can't. There were schooners used on the coast of California in the lumber trade, they called dog hole schooners because there are little narrow harbors on the northern coast of California where there's a lot of timber, but there's not much of a, or any coastal plain. So they're steep, rocky, a dog hole. You had to get in there, load up the timber, and get out. And this was the girl who was going to do it for you. Okay, next one, please. Lights, please. This speaks to water depth. This is a, a catch, a Harrishoff catch, a beautiful boat by definition because it was built by. Um, L. Francis Harrishoff, or designed by L. Francis Harrishoff. It has been in Apalachicola. It's in the yard in Apalachicola now, up by the mill pond. You see how deep she is. Her, her, her draft is, I've never measured it, but it's at least five feet. My boat is here, our boat is here, so I look at her and rub her with a pork chop bone every once in a while. But she's a deep draft, fixed keel, outside fixed keel, 
at least five feet. That is a common place for ocean-going sailing vessels. But it's completely dysfunctional for the waters here. It's completely dysfunctional for the waters in Galveston Bay and Padre Island and a lot of places on the East Coast up around Long Island. Shoal draft. And it's completely dysfunctional in places like the Netherlands, where they have a different way of f solving the need to have a drop drop keel. They have lee boards instead of center boards. So a schooner that has the agility and the speed because of her sail plan needs to have, depending on the water she works in, I'll show you some schooners with underbodies like this, needs to be able to go into shoal water. OK, next one, please. Think of the Bernoulli effect here. You can see it. Whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. More goes better, closer to the wind, more weatherly. And because it's fore and aft, the sheets, as we all know, the sheets can be on a horse to slide back and forth. So when you tack, you just turn. You don't have to, you have to let go up here unless it's on a horse. But these just go. You don't have to call out all the lads from down below and struggle around and curse and fall over everybody and have a big crew. You can it just go. It so go. OK, next, please. OK, this is a fruit schooner from the south coast of England. In the 1830s to the 1860s, there was a big trade from the south coast of England to a variety of places, to the Mediterranean. Boats like this that had to go down through past the English Channel, down through the Bay of Biscay. I'm going to show you a map in a minute. Through the Straits of Gibraltar, down the Mediterranean. And they would go to places like Greece. And they would get dates and olives and currants and raisins that could be transported back because they were, were dry. They would also go to the Azores in the mid-Atlantic and get oranges, which they would take back and make a lot of money on with them to the upper middle class households of London. They would also go to the Bahamas and bring back pineapples. When they brought back pineapples, they would install temporary racks in their holes so that the individual pineapples could have airspace between them. They tried to keep the hatches open for ventilation. And the belief was, because even in the 1830s and 1860s, there was still steam was coming up, there was a belief among the merchants that steam-powered boats damaged the fruit either with the heat or the um, smoke or you know, whatever. So a lot of guys built a lot of boats, bought a lot of fruit schooners. And some of them are, are much more dramatic and noble than this. They're like small clipper ships. And you can see she's got a four, a square sail, a square four topsail. So if she goes down the med, let's let's have a, a next one, please. She comes into the here's Gibraltar. She's come from up here, across the Bay of Biscay, down here. She comes into the med, and there's a westerly blowing. She can not only wing out her gaff sails, she can set that square sole and just run down here. Or if she's coming back and there's an easterly blowing. OK, so here are 
This is currants, raisins, figs, oranges, lemons, naples, olive oil, maize, marble, not a fruit, obviously, wine, hazelnuts. I can't read that. And they also were, here's uh, southern Spain, Portugal, port wine from Portugal, big trade for centuries, port wine from Oporto in northern Portugal to London. I wrote a blog about this called Rabello Boats. Rabello Boats are the boats that brought the wine down a river through the rapids. So deep water, speed is important, time is important, therefore speed is important. Deep water here, deep water all the way back to southern England. So a boat with an underbody like the Harrishoff catch was what you wanted. It made sense, it was practical. Here and other places, not practical. So you got to put the rig you want on the hull that works if you want to combine speed with agility with practicality. Okay, next one. This is my, one of my favorites. This is the Alma. Alma is a scow schooner, topsail schooner, built in San Francisco, California in 1890, I believe. There were about 40 scow schooners working exclusively in San Francisco Bay. And San Francisco Bay is, is a confluence of four or five bays from a very large estuary. A lot of stuff going on. She is now still sailing. She's become a dude boat. More about dude boat. A dude boat is a boat that carries passengers for pay. She is owned by the National Park Association and they have a national park at the, uh, the one of the docks in San Francisco. It's a big deal. They have other ships there. They have a C.A. Thayer, a lumber schooner. But they take Alma out and sail her with the public on board. They carried oyster shells, they carried cattle, sheep, grannies, pigs, you name it, back and forth across San Francisco Bay because the Golden Gate was not, bridge was not built until the 1930s. Okay, now the other thing they carried was hay. Think of a city of let's say 100,000 people, a city almost anywhere, but especially in, in the late 19th century. All the personal conveyance, all the taxi cabs, all the trolley cars, all the delivery wagons, all the mail carriers, most importantly, all the beer wagons would be pulled by horses. Everything that we have today in this time was pulled by horses. In fact, it was the 19th century. That's what they had to work. That was tractive power, okay? And those horses had to be up. They weren't turned out on 40 acres of pasture, which wouldn't have lasted very long anyway, every night. They had to be up and stable so they could go to work the next day. They could be fed and go to work the next day. Be available, go, let's go. They were fed primarily hay, probably some grain, some concentrates for energy, but mostly hay. So how did that hay get there? Next, next one, please. This is the Annie, same deal, just like the, the Alma. Now's the time to talk about her, their hull design. These scow schooners had a hull like a cigar box, literally. Flat, 
square, shallow, rect or rectangular, shallow. They had a bowsprit, they were schooner rigged, topsails, but the hull was flat and it had a big honking centerboard like the Governor Stone for work in shoal waters because they had to sail from the city of San Francisco all the way up past Alcatraz, past a uh, place I always wish I lived in. Sausalito. Sausalito, thank you. <laughs> yeah. Actually, now I'm glad I don't. Go uh, up the Sacramento River. Sausalito. They went to the Sacramento River Delta. They went through the Carquinan Strait, where our son had an apartment, way up to the Sacramento River Delta. There were giant meadows there fed by the fresh water of the Sacramento River and inundated with mud like the Nile to bring nutrients. And that's where all this hay, or most of the hay, was cut and loaded on. So who's going to ask me how they steered with that? OK. Well, I wasn't there. I'm an old guy, but I'm not that old. What I have seen are pictures and reliable artists' um, representations of platforms. This is, this is the bow, I believe. Platforms that came up high and that they re-rigged the ropes for the steering, connecting the wheel to the rudder. They still had have sail area up here. They would reef the sails, but instead of bringing the, boo the gaff down, they raised the boom up. So the sail was above, some part of it was above the hay, and then they could fly the topsail as well. And because they were flat, when the tide went out, and there's a big tidal range in San Francisco, they could sit on the bottom. They could take the bottom, take the ground, pull up the centerboard. She's not gonna, you're not gonna spend the night like this. She's flat. You can load her when she's flat. You're tied up to the dock, you, it's even easier. And then when the tide comes in, she lifts up. You drop the centerboard, don't ask me how, there's some magical arrangement or a slot or you'd send a guy down in there, I don't know. But they get the centerboard down and sail back. And there, all the hay for all the horses was distributed by horses from the dockside. And you can imagine, given the number of horses and the amount of hay each boat could carry, see there's another one over there. This went on for a long time. So practical, shoal draft, schooner rig, shoal draft, she can take the ground because she's got a, a, a centerboard, and she's a workhorse. The fruit schooner, if she were a horse, would be a, a thoroughbred racehorse because she had high value, low volume cargoes. This is either a Percheron draft horse or a mule, okay? Bulky, strong, not maybe particularly pretty, but just what you need. Now, I'm gonna jump ahead and just take a minute there is a video, you can see videos on the YouTube wormhole on the Alma. And there's one called BADS, B-A-A-D-S, Bay Area Association of Disabled Sailors. And they go down to the National Park and they go out on this boat. So it shows them on a sunny, breezy day. And these are people with crutches, on crutches, with prosthetic devices, with walkers, with wheelchairs, with service dogs. And this is the perfect boat for them. It's flat, it's stable, it's not gonna go over, heel over like a racing 
sled and send everybody into the scuppers. She's stable, wheelchair, dog, whatever. And it's wonderful to see that. And that's completely serendipitous. She wasn't, <laughs> there were no, the only uh, prosthetic devices around when she was built was a wooden leg. But to see that coming together of in a niche for a new purpose for a boat that's 130 years old is pretty cool. And I think that's what's happening, going to happen, or has happened to some degree already with the Governor's Stone. OK, so water depth, you deal with that with shoal draft and center boards. Fast, you deal that with the rig. Agile, you deal with that with the, with the rig. Practical, again, you're back to water depth. OK, let's go to the next one, please. This is another type of scow schooner. This is in Texas, at Port Aransas. This, you see, she's, the Alma's bow looks like this. She's got a much more defined bow. She's got a swept up stem. There's going to be a cut water and a bowsprit here. There were lots of these scow schooners in Texas for the same reason they're in San Francisco Bay, shoal water. Except in Texas, they call them butthead schooners. Why butthead? Because it's Texas. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> In 1941, a very well-known and famous marine architect and archaeologist, uh, and historian rather, uh, Howard Chappelle, found the remains, the derelict remains of one of these, on the beach in Galveston. And he took the lines. He, he was great at doing that. And he drew a set of lines. And this boat was built years ago, 20 years ago. I'm. To my knowledge, she's not yet in the water. She's, she's uh, changed hands several times. But she is a different kind of scow schooner. Not a little more elegant, not as blunt bowed and clunky as the Alma. Uh, and she is built with uh, plywood and fiberglass cloth embedded in, in uh, epoxy resin, I believe. OK, next. This is uh, the Governor's Stone again. So the Governor's Stone, you know, compared to some of these others, is small. And that's one of the things that makes her agile. She's got the right rig. She's about, where's Colleen? Outside. 42 feet long. 40 foot on deck. 40 foot on deck. 20 foot, 20 foot bowsprit. And 12 foot beam? 20, 20 foot bowsprit. And beam? Uh, 18, I think. OK. Um, I've got some, some uh, drawings of her coming up. So this was, uh, I'm, I'm trying to find the right equine equivalent. Um, and I don't have it. This is going around in shoal draft, jack of all trades, just like the t very similar to the Texas butthead. More elegant, more beautiful, but very similar. Shoal draft, not flat bottom, but shoal draft. Centerboard, long centerboard. And remember, centerboards are are useful. They are not only an automatic sounding device, when you hear it drag, pull it up. If you need to come into some place, and there are records of this being done, you come into some place, you drop it. And you just, it's like dragging your foot. You're just slowing her down, taking the way off, slowing her down, letting that board drag. As the, just like you can scandalize the sails and do things to take the foot off the, the gas with that. So 
I'll tell you what I know about the Governor Stone, which is, is not as much as I wish it were. Let's have the next one, please. Okay, here we are. There's Pascagoula. And uh, the Laguna Madre of, of the Texas coast, the, the huge lagoon caused by Padre and other islands that goes all the way down past the border and down into Mexico in the state of Tamaulipas starts over here. So that's scow schooner butthead country. Runs about, about like this from, from the Sabine River down about, I think, a couple hundred miles south of where the, board, where the Rio Grande comes out. Um, so this, these are the waters where the, the, where the Governor Stone and her sisters worked. Okay, next. Here's a bird's eye view of the Governor Stone deck plan. Um, this is, obviously these are the masts, and this is almost the entire length of, the, the centerboard runs almost this entire length. And it would be hoisted with a lanyard on a tackle, either on the mast or, or raised up here. I think, I think her proportions are about three, three to one length to, to beam. Let's, and very small cabin. Okay, next. This is the one that I like because the only time I was aboard the Governor Stone was when she was here and I went below decks and I was struck by, if this is, one, two, this is four feet. So this at most is five feet, and that's not to the deck beams, but to the, the bottom of the hatch. So she was, there's not all that much room down here. So what was it like to load her and unload her? Um, it was hot and sweaty. And what would she, what would she carry? Would she carry loose cargo? Probably. Um, would she carry bales of stuff? Would she carry a deck cargo? Probably. Um, you can, you know, these, these boats were, were fungible. You could nail stuff up, put up panels and turn the sheep out there. Although in Texas you couldn't have sheep, but uh, there's, there's a lot of stuff you can do in these kind of work boats. These are the, the FedEx delivery vans, the step vans, the UPS, the plumbers vans, the 14 foot goosenecks, if you haul livestock, that's, they did all of those things. And so did boats like the Alma, the, the Scout Schooner Alma. Okay, next please. Now this is a little sad, but I'm gonna show it to you anyway. I ran across this, or I guess Susan ran across this. You can't see this very well, but right down here, it says governor. And this is thought, according to the caption, to be the Governor Stone back in the days when she was an oyster carrier. So I've, I'm showing you this for several reasons. Four mast, no main mast, deck house, dirty, beat up, no bowsprit, that makes it easier to get in close to a dock, loaded with oysters and all the debris associated with them and this smell. 
but she's still working. And this was the case with a lot of the boats. A lot of the boats in this uh, book I showed you, the sketches from the guy from the W Works Progress Association, had come from, some were built here, some were built in Pascagoula or Biloxi, but a lot of them came from either the Bahamas or Key West, and some of them from the Northeast. And they were, came down and they were used for sponge boats. They were used for oyster boats. The, the, the hull and a, and a two banger um, engine was all that you needed. And we all, if you know about anything about the Governor of Stone, you know that during Prohibition, she was also used to haul rum in illegally from uh, the Bahamas, I believe. So feel bad about the way she looks, but feel good about the fact that she was still working. And because of that, to some degree, she's still with us today. When all, and a lot of these boats aren't, the Alma was saved by the federal government. Um, OK, next. This is what I'm going to end with, and I have to uh, consult my Would you find the last page with the Wyoming on it? It should be the very last page. OK, thank you. This is in Bath, Maine just uh, maybe a quarter or half a mile north of the Bath Iron Works. This is the grounds of the main Maritime Museum. And it was, in the late 19th, early 20th century, a shipyard uh, belonging to a firm called Percy and Small. And when they went out of business, they just walked away. They left the building with a lofting floor they left all the tools, and there weren't a whole lot. The buildings, everything. And I don't know the details of how the main Maritime Museum got it, but they did. And there's a, you can see there's a slight, slight slope, and there's a river here. And what's the name of the river, Pam, that flows through Bath? OK. I don't know. Anyway, they launched it right here. They built all their boats here. They were built two or three at a time. These sheds over here have a co wonderful collection of small craft. And this is a monumental sculpture, I say, of the schooner Wyoming, which was built right here. Six masted, one, two, three, four, five, six. There's her stem, there's her bowsprit, there's her taffrail, and there's her stern and rudder. She was the largest wooden boat ever built. She was built in 1909. Her specs are 350 feet on deck, 50 foot beam, 30 foot draft, a crew of 11, plus a mass, a captain, two mates, a cook, and an engineer. She had 22 sails. She was lost at sea on the 11th of March, 1924, with all hands, off the coast of Chatham, Massachusetts. There's a, you, you want I know someone wants to know, what did, what did they have an engineer for? They had steam donkeys. 
A steam donkey is not an angry donkey. <laughs> it's, a, it's a small engine. It's, I, I'm, I'm writing about this with this chikimula thing, and you can see one only if you look at my box. Uh, they had a, a gypsy on them, so you could raise the sails, because human beings couldn't raise these sails. You could raise an anchor chain. You could pump the bilges, all with a steam donkey. And the, she, in her late in her life, and when she went aground, when she was lost, was hauling coal. She could call, haul 6,000 tons of coal from Virginia to the Northeast. So as late as 1920s and later, with the Chikimula, they were using steam in conjunction with sail. Steam to do the heavy work and to keep down the crew cost. Sail to keep down the energy cost. So this is the Wyoming. It's wonderful. This, because it's black and white, it doesn't do it justice. But they built this wonderful, I call it a sculpture. Um, and it's obviously it's it's minimalist, but it it lets you absorb the scale of this thing. Um, okay, and she could obviously with a, a draft of thirty feet, she needed some deep water to go into. Okay, any questions or comments? Like. Okay.